Uh, thank you all for being here. I wanted to just follow up on this uh, uh, amazing lecture of spinal cord uh, tumors with uh, spinal cord injury care. Reflecting on the burden, barriers to recovery, uh, very brief on treatments and treatment outlooks. So this is going to be more board review level kind of a thing because on every one of those topics there can be a whole day spent. And again, I uh, want to advertise for the um, uh, various events we have here. We have the annual spine trauma course and we have many of the people who you'll see referred here as lecturers here. So it's a, a very in-depth, much deeper dive. And this has obviously become a flagship thing for us here at SSF uh, with the leadership of Dr. Tubbs in exploring the spinal cord more. These are some basic numbers in this very difficult to read slide. But basically in this country, depending upon definition, we probably have about three million people with some degree of paralysis. And again, traumatic paralysis is one of them. For traumatic paralysis, this is a um, uh, best possible global prevalence chart. And again, um, the darker numbers like Alaska are really shocking. And this is something that we see a lot of patients from Alaska who come here with spinal cord injuries. We have a treatment agreement with that state. And again, there's probably a lack of reporting, like in Africa, that leads to this being a, a not well-recognized entity there. The spinal cord injury remains a fatal disease in many parts of the world. And again, as we look at it by cause, we see a significant shift, for instance, in Japan. This is far more ground-level falls seen in dark blue. Uh, the, the falls in simple, um, more or less geriatric etiologies are clearly on the rise. So the basic nutshell that you should know is it's a bimodal distribution, under 30 and males. Road traffic accidents and traumatic events such as gunshot wounds are still a leading cause in that uh, demographic. But the over 50 segment, and that includes me sadly, is a significant um, uh, problem and much on the rise. And in fact, in some countries like Japan now, the leading cause of spinal cord injury, think OPLL, congenital stenosis, end-stage spondylosis, ankle and spondylitis, and ground-level falls. And there's a great new article coming out uh, with our Global Burden of Disease group here in Seattle in the Lancet this fall. And uh, Lindsay Tetro has also done a very nice survey on this. The fact is nowadays with better medical care, spinal cord injury patients, as a former patient of mine, uh, continue to live and uh, they're very active, but they're also unhappy frequently with their spinal cord injury. And they rightfully demand that we make advances like a, uh, in the fields of cancer and cardiac care. So they live and they live active lives. And yes, our rehabilitation doctors have done a great job uh, mainstreaming them. Our legal profession has done a very good job uh, advancing integration into society with the ADA, uh, which is an, a, a very visionary and almost unprecedented act around the world. Uh, you've seen a little bit about spinal cord uh, anatomy. And again, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details in this Sunday morning. Um, this is obviously a deep dive uh, worthy uh, undertaking. The main thing that we have been really amiss at, and Dr. Tubbs says that very eloquently, is that we're stuck in a 1910 anatomy understanding of columnar distribution. All of these charts that we see here are probably mainly myth-based. They're very simplistic. Uh, what we're not understanding, what we have a very poor understanding is the in incredible three-dimensional cross-referencing, uh, uh, which uh, really uh, explains a lot of the recovery potential and also offers an outlook for future um, uh, restoration therapies. So this is from the uh, famous mouse atlas from Paul Allen's Brain Institute here in Seattle. And again, this three-dimensionality is again the focus of our SSF research work under the direction of Dr. Tubbs. We'll have our second annual fundraiser here. There are basic three mechanisms, and this is something that you should all know. And this is why we still need to look and understand what patients are doing. The distraction injury is and remains the single worst um, neurotoxic uh, event. Basically, it's nerve cell destruction is uh, the most irreversible. Where we can interfere is in compression and uh, certainly in contusion or concussion injuries, the latter being the hallmark of the so-called central cord syndrome. You know about the basic membrane physiology, and again, the phospholipid membranes are the main stabilizing element, and again, they prevent calcium from flowing into the um, uh, nerve cells, uh, which then release glutamate. Uh, this is probably the single biggest uh, problem. There's an increased recognition that these phospholipid membranes are 
unbelievably important in terms of cell mediation with the environment. And they do that in part with receptors and in part with these sodium ion uh, proton channels. These are proton pumps that are truly at the key for keeping the um, cellular equipoise for nerve cells. And this is obviously what gets disrupted uh, in a pathologic situation. So this is an actual electron microscopy picture of membrane unraveling. That's, again, in the early stages of nerve cell injuries. And this, again, leads to the predictable selling, the infamous acidosis, cell death, and, again, the glutamate uh, release, uh, which then creates a uh, basically toxic, neurotoxic uh, effect. This is a nice diagram by Michael Felings's group. And, again, this shows in a diagram, again, the presynaptic and the postsynaptic uh, uh, loss of uh, electron balance with the sodium and a calcium influx that uh, more or less explodes nerve cells. And again, glutamate is the key uh, messenger that uh, seems to be uh, a, a very toxic uh, mediator. All of us know uh, the difference of a primary and the secondary zone of injury. And again, most of the research that we're doing right now really tries to uh, tamper with the secondary zone of injury to try to get one or two, maybe more um, uh, grades of motor strength back. Uh, the primary zone of injury is still a very significant challenge. All of us know the basic types of spinal cord injuries. I'm not going to delve into the sub-differentiations. But the single biggest importance for you as uh, treating surgeons is the differentiation and recognition of an incomplete injury. This changes the entire ballgame and outlook of patients. I'm not saying that we should not treat complete injuries, but the recognition and the understanding of what is an incomplete injury is so important in the early stages because that's where we have had the single biggest gains in terms of neurologic function. For survival and for quality of life, uh, effective treatment of complete patients remains very much uh, important. But uh, for instance, in the mid-thoracic cord injuries, we've honestly not had any great improvements. For cervical cord injuries, the uh, story is quite different. And again, this is a brief overview by our former fellow Brad Jacobs um, from Canada now. Do you recognize that, Andrew? Yes, yeah. yeah, a very nice uh, graph. I've never seen this done better. And again, he's basically on the top graph shown the main uh, regeneration obstacles, and then at the bottom, the regeneration strategies. I'm not going to read those out. But this is a very nice summary slide that identifies the complexity also of our uh, neuronal injury and regeneration strategies. One of the key things to point out is the timeline of spinal cord injuries, which mimics that of other um, perfusion-dependent organ systems very closely. And based on animal models, we can surmise that for cord pathology, we have a six to eight hour timeline before irreversible changes take place. Uh, for peripheral nerves, it's probably about a 24 to 48 hour. So the cauda equina syndrome that you see depicted down there in a state of evolution, you would theoretically have about 24 to 48 hours to make a difference, perhaps longer also for more chronic regeneration strategies. A key problem is inherent in this slide, and that is that most, quote, early interventions have a time window of 24 to 48 hours, some even 72 hours. And as you can very well see, this is actually physiologically not correlatable. So six hours is probably the main cord pathology uh, ischemic period that we can live with. And again, this is a very nice uh, slide to try to more or less identify the three main stages of timeline, the acute injury. Again, it's still listed at 48 hours, which I personally think is too wide. The subacute injury for about two weeks until more or less the initial hematoma has stabilized. And then uh, the six month uh, window where we have more or less the intermediate uh, to late changes. So again, going back to the membrane unraveling slide, we're trying to prevent this membrane unraveling. And the basic ABCs are so important and so much overlooked. No oxygenation, normal hematocrit, and the mean arterial pressure should be above 80, some say 85 millimeters per mercury level. Uh, again, I'm going to talk briefly about other factors, but one of the key things is down here in the red box, and that is Roger's rules from 1959, protect, decompress, realign, and stabilize. He had none of the basic, uh, he had none of the advanced technologies that we saw uh, in our exhibit rooms and that we've demonstrated over the last couple of days. But those basic paradigms apply. And if you remember those and apply those, you'll never go wrong. Now let's delve right into the heart of controversy, the steroids. On the right side is the well-publicized, and I think uh, everybody knows that here, uh, a NASC is two dose. It should be done for 24 hours. Uh, there had been a NASC is three rule for 48 hours plus, which has been very heavily debated. 
I want to point out this is a non-FDA approved treatment, so we need to be very cognizant about the regulatory dimension, so this is not an approved spinal cord injury treatment. And the famous studies that uh, uh, these uh, recommendations were based upon were not FDA studies. They were done by uh, Michael Bracken, and they're basically multi-center empirical studies. So this is a very interesting and important differentiation. Uh, Dr. Hurlbert um, uh, and colleagues in Canada have done a very sobering assessment of the role of methylprednisolone. And again, this is just a brief uh, pictogram, which I, uh, I don't want you to read this. I'm just wanting all of you um, as investigators to really apply this principle in any publication that you make in the future of having these kind of flow charts. This is really very transparent and offers a greater insight for reviewers. But um, you don't have to look at the detailed print. Uh, basically, there's not a big difference in terms of uh, scores, in terms of no steroid or steroid patients, if they looked at the NASCIS-2 data in this very large, I think it's about 800 patients, uh, Canadian study. So their conclusion was that there's no benefit in steroids. And this has led to a big kind of a, uh, a revirement, a more or less reassessment of what is steroids actually doing. And there are a lot of suggestions, and all of these articles kind of have passages of how complication with steroids are. Um, so when you actually go back to the source of it, this is an article from Japan where they did a very large administrative, administrative database dive. And this Chikuda study is actually what's at the heart of it. And when you read this, you see death and infections and pneumonias and everything. When you actually look at the data, and it helps to look at the data, there are actually only two factors that were different. GI bleeds, which I tell you from having used steroids for over a quarter century at Harborview, which was one of the NASCIS 2 and 3 study sites. If you have adequate H2 prevention, GI bleeds are not an issue, should not be. And length of stay, which again, that was substantial. Uh, I still have no idea how this could have happened in Japan. I have been to Japan. I've seen their spinal cord injury centers. They do a nice job. I still can't explain that number. This is not something I've seen, but I have only empirical states to point out. The main thing about steroids that I still maintain is it is the only proven animal and human membrane swelling preventative agent. The sooner you give it, the better. This is without a question. Uh, something that we apply, for instance, on oncologic care for spinal cord tumors. There's no question that this has an effect. The, we can't claim that this is a spinal cord injury therapy, hence the FDA restriction is actually very reasonable. So at this point in time, they're an option. Now I'm going to tell you something, that probably by December, there'll be an AO International release that basically has reassessed this Canadian study of steroids, and we will come out with a tempered recommendation in favor of steroids for spinal cord injury. So I can't give you a reference for that yet, but uh, stay tuned. Obviously, you have to use precautions such as H2 blockade. You have to practice good anti-infection principles and early mobilization without a question. So within 24 hours of injury, cord only, and apparently the NASCIS-2 dose appears safe. The effectiveness I'm not going to go into. The other most studied and tempting pharmacologic agent is really Azole. Um, again, this is a very interesting FDA-approved drug for a number of neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS. It has prolonged survival there. It's a membrane-stabilizing agent. And again, this is the graph of Michael Feelings' group. And it basically interferes with the sodium proton pump and thus prevents glutamate release and the neuroexitotoxic effect of glutamate release in uncontrolled fashion. It does enhance reuptake also in glial cells. The only trial so far is Robert Grossman's um, from Houston, who is the uh, primary investigator of the NACTIN group, with which we are a part of. And again, they did show a benefit in cervical spinal cord injuries. Now again, you'll notice that thoracic cord injuries were not looked at because our outlook of recovery for those, if they're truly complete, remains uh, sadly very bleak. But in cervical spinal cord injuries, Riluzol has had a membrane stabilizing effect. With the AO North America group, we've done uh, and continue to do a prospective study. And again, uh, we hope to have a sufficient enrollment in about two years. I'm not going to delve into all the other details, but those are three major uh, agents that have a theoretical potential. Interestingly, one, the gangliosides by Fred Geiser, uh, had such promise in the beginning. Uh, they offered the prospect of uh, neuroplasticity. Um, there were no differences in their phase three trial. 
Now, Michael Failings has undertaken it to do a repeat dive into this. And actually, if you parse out cervical from thoracic cord injuries, you see a substantial difference there. So maybe unrightly so, the ganglioside have been poo-pooed. Uh, minocycline, antibiotic, and magnesium are two other substances that are being investigated by a number of groups. And again, expect a number of publications out on this. Uh, I'm going to hold my breath on them right now. But uh, again, just be aware that these are out there. One of the most compelling initial things is that of early surgical intervention. And I think we have a clear consensus nowadays that early cervical spine realignment with closed reduction is safe and effective even prior to an MRI scan or if an MRI scan takes too long. I'm not going to delve into that, but we had a who's who panel here in this very room in our, I think, next uh, third annual, I think, spine trauma course. And there's no question that there's a national consensus, a North American consensus, that is, on this topic. But what about surgery done early versus late? And again, uh, this is a prospective um, surgeon patient preference group, early versus late. Early defined as within 24 hours. Again, this is a very wide cast net, but was the most stringent one at that point in time. And you can see the difference. And again, they're not dramatic, but there was a statistically significant difference of respondents uh, with AIS uh, grade two and larger changes. And it was also deemed to be safe uh, in terms of not having a higher complication rate. So I will tell you right now that uh, early surgical intervention with effective decompression and stabilization of probably more segments than we historically frequently did is becoming the preferred treatment. Without putting words into that, the other element of this is you have to be able to do it swiftly without much bleeding. So a second hit in terms of further hypotension or significant anemia or blood loss is not desirable. So you can't go into metabolic acidosis or so during your surgical extravaganza. You have to be able to do this relatively swiftly with a very limited blood loss. Um, going into the repair area, I will defer to one particular article that I really like. Uh, it's uh, Chris who has a very nice survey article in neurosurgery from 2017. It's really well done, balanced. Um, uh, the key extract that I want to point out there is there's no doubt at this point in time that blood pressure enhancement with a MAP of 85 plus is highly recommendable. So as you're in an operating room, as you're doing a cord uh, resection, as you're doing a restoration of a complex deformity, be sure to talk to your anesthesiologists and talk about having the MAPs above 85, keeping the crit above 30. Yes, you have to give blood transfusions. Yes, you have to have a more aggressive, intelligent resuscitation protocol, avoiding that. Hypothermia and CSF drainage are emerging topics, uh, which really require far more scrutiny. I'm just pointing those out. And there's a, again, a nice, more detailed, and differentiated resourcing in the AHUA article. I cannot go into cell regeneration strategies. Allow me the following summary. Uh, this is something that with the topic of stem cells has uh, uh, received undue media attention in an undifferentiated fashion. I don't want to sound like a certain politician here, but it's uh, very frustrating to have patients, I'm sure you see them in your clinics all the time, who want their discs and their spinal cords and whatever regenerated with stem cells. We now have a state, and this is my personal summary, where we can have neural cell uh, uh, more or less survival in a host setting uh, uh, be feasible. These are undifferentiated neural cells. These are not directionally functional. So this is a big step. We have yet no idea how they will grow in the future because we've removed some of the inhibitory mechanisms. But the targeted regeneration in terms of functionally meaningful fashion really is not uh, present yet. Uh, so the main things that are now emerging are that we have to have a combined strategy of cell regeneration or repopulation and neural scaffolding, uh, which prevents glial scar formation and probably has some form of a resection of the primary injury zone and creating stable uh, uh, bridges. So that's really the main target zone right now. But let me go into a subject that has had a dramatic immediate effect on patients, whereas the cell regeneration strategy is honestly probably about 10 years away from clinical, meaningful, documentable uh, applications. So this has been obviously sci-fi. And again, here's a differentiation of cyborgs and robots. And again, this is a, an important semantic differentiation with cyborgs being both organic and 
biomechanotronic. I'm not making up that word. So exoskeletons have arrived in a number of applications. And again, most of those are passive devices that basically um, are somehow triggered indirectly by, our, um, uh, by stimuli such as a foot a hit or a hand signal or something like that. But they can, endurance, uh, they can improve endurance and strength. Now, we've had experience with something called human assistive limb, which is something interesting because this is a neurobionic device. This is actually triggered by a CNS input, and it can correlate to um, appropriate, functionally uh, correlated uh, muscle groups. So this is Professor Sankai, who's really probably the world leader in this from Japan. And again, uh, he's demonstrated this technology uh, to help uh, workers in Fukushima uh, work much longer hours with very heavy equipment on. So he's now applied this with the help of German uh, um, uh, surgeons. And again, Dr. Ilmas is from uh, a center in Germany that has actually applied this uh, in a very aggressive neurobionic rehab fashion. And again, it's more or less like a ultimate biofeedback machine. So it takes whatever impulses are left and augments them in a relevant, force-appropriate fashion so that the patient can work with that and function with that, but also retrain uh, still maintained uh, functional groups. So this is the biofeedback machine. It's very impressive to see how over time people literally with mind control can start activating these machines. And the more your own function increases, the more the robot will sense that and decrease their input. So this is, again, the basic concept. And again, it's an incredibly powerful thing to see on a functional MRI scans how, for instance, the hand region in paraplegics decreases in its representation and lower extremity areas increase. So these are some of the indications that it's been used for. And um, there are several results that have been done here now. And again, uh, uh, this is a great uh, topic of research for Emre, who's really deserved a lot of credit for this. This is from a German group. And again, this is some of the functional MRI scans that show how the hand region actually decreases after these patients regain ambulatory potential. Now, without wanting to extrapolate too much in their spinal cord injury, population. This was an early eight-patient group of chronic injury patients of over a year out. They found some sensory recovery, decreased pain, uh, voluntary urinary, urinary function with motor and spasticity reduction. And these are some of their early results, but basically uh, in terms of steps, walking, uh, duration, uh, timed uh, uh, stand up and go, basically they had very impressive results. They now are over 100 patients of chronic spinal cord injury patients. And again, these functional recoveries were all obtained without any uh, decrements, and there were no significant adverse events. So they have just now received FDA approval here in the country, and we are very proud to have been the only North American center that has done uh, this HAL therapy. We had eight patients to contribute from the US that had very significant positive findings. This is a case from Germany, and this is, again, now changed care in Germany and in, I think, all of Europe. Is that right, Emery? So the European community has adopted this as a preferred treatment for spinal cord injury patients with some preservation, so incomplete again. Um, this is a case, an example. This patient was three months out from a devastating C3-4 uh, fracture dislocation. She's a professional trapeze artist and had crashed head down, totally healthy and fit. And I'm going to try to get this to work. Uh, she had received urgent surgical decompression and fusion. And I think it was at around four months or so, they put her into this unit. Again, this is this HAL unit. You're suspended uh, in a weight neutralizing fashion from the ceiling. And uh, the robot basically picks up any signals. The therapist works. This is what happens after 12 weeks of a very rigid protocol that the Germans used with this uh, Japanese technique. So it's a really successful German-Japanese uh, example of collaboration. So walking speed and everything improved dramatically. And what does this mean in real life? So this is uh, one of those things that I've learned uh, to hear from our neurorehabilitation specialist. This is again in the German center that they built. Uh, this patient regained some ambulatory function of an incomplete cervical cord injury. She has significant hand spasticity. It's after four weeks. Now this is after three months of this HAL therapy, basically a coordinated gait. There's no therapist needed. Uh, there are no bells or whistles to this. This is just very diligent daily exercise and uh, uh, using this device for augmentation of what has been left. Um, there was one other slide that I want to show here, which for me uh, was most compelling. Um, this is uh, the patient actually climbing a staircase on her own after 12 weeks. 
one insight that I've gained is that um, when we looked at, and I think it's vastly overlooked, when we looked at what therapists have to do to try to mobilize an incomplete cord injury, it usually means three therapists who are, on, one of them is on their knees, and they're trying to get a patient to walk one kind of, one length of a floor. And it's an unbelievable human effort on four people, the patient first and foremost, but three therapists. And with this device, a single therapist can gain literally a walking range of several miles in uh, an under two hour period. So it's way more resource effective and the output is much better. So again, this is a new evolving technology that is here and now. It is FDA approved as of this January. It's been a big breakthrough. We're very proud to have been part of this. Uh, what I see in this is it gives damaged nerves a purpose, a motor function which is beneficial and overrides deleterious non-functional uh, status quo um, uh, situations. And again, it also is a paradigm shift because it really uh, takes away the uh, focus which rehab has been so much directed at of independent mobilization with a wheelchair towards actual functional recovery. And it has a much more immediate and directed impact probably on cell regeneration. Of course, we have to shift to an ongoing regulatory burden, which is now mainly not the FDA anymore, but payers, because we have no CPT codes for this, believe it or not. In conclusion, spinal cord injury is, I think, and I would hope to inspire all of you who have been here on the Sunday morning after uh, three very hard days, I think that this should be our key challenge for our spine surgeon community. This is something that the public really wants answers for. I think we should be much better at prevention and early recognition strategies, and this will tie nicely into Dr. Moisey's next lecture. And the treatment now is becoming pretty clear. We should really invoke uh, resus resuscitation protocols that emphasize early MAPs and uh, hemodynamic recovery, early decompression and stabilization, and probably larger, longer segments that we historically did. Uh, with a swift and meaningful intervention are probably really important. And again, as I see this right now, all steroid debates and really is all debates and whatever aside, the most promising intervention right now for early recovery of uh, patients with a significant acute cord injury with some preservation of nerve function is probably neurobotic treatment. Uh, with this, I want to thank the SSF staff. I'll have to leave here in a second. I apologize uh, for their great efforts. It's just such a joy to get to work with these wonderful people. And I'll warn all of you about predatory faculty because these sweatshirts, which were made by Dr. Escuyan for you as a gift, have been found to have been stolen by faculty. So, uh, so this is really something I want to uh, warn you about. I want to thank all of you for being such a great and participatory audience. Appreciate it.